Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive, and I welcome, want to welcome you all to the pre-vice presidential debate uh, session this evening. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about privacy, security, and how that balances against innovation in, in, in schools and how we can't let fear uh, take over our desire for innovation and, uh, and advancement of, the, of students. Uh, there's a few things that I want to go over before we get started. Uh, first of all, I want to say that this series is uh, has been put together by FETC, or the Future of Education Technology Conference. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about FETC a little bit later, but thank you, for FETC, for putting together some great speakers on some really important technical topics. Now, a little bit about EdChat Interactive. Uh, EdChat Interactive was founded by myself, Steve Anderson, and Tom Whitby. And our purpose was to allow, was to create a forum for educators to share best practices. Uh, there just didn't seem to be a great way for educators who are doing great things to share them with, with other educators. Uh, you've all been to webinars in the past, and you know that webinars don't really work the way we all learn. Uh, so we wanted to come up with a way that more resembled the way great teachers teach. And I hope that you find that here today. We, we're using um, some of the principles of andragogy to allow you to collaborate and communicate with each other and to lock in the learning. And in order to do that, we're using a platform called Shindig. Uh, Shindig allows you to interact in ways that uh, I've never seen another webinar type platform do. What you'll notice, uh, the first couple features I want to go over are there's two buttons underneath your avatar. There's the raise hand button and the ask button. The raise hand button uh, is a way for you to signal me where you are. So there's, there's going to be some, some times during the session where uh, Bob or I say, uh, we'd like a volunteer to come up on stage and discuss this issue with us. And if you'd like to volunteer, and I'd, and I'd like to encourage you to volunteer, you'll press that raise hand button. And uh, that will let me know that you're interested in coming up, and I'll bring you up. And then the other button is ask. If you have a question, uh, if it's a technical question, uh, then I'll answer it. If it's a question for Bob, uh, then you can click on that ask button. Uh, I'll get the question after you type it in, and then I'll pass it on to Bob, or maybe I'll just pop up on the screen and, and ask it on the screen. So those are the first two ways of interact, interacting, the raise hand button. Uh, if you want to come up on stage or you want me to notice you, you'll click the raise hand button. If you have a question for either me or for Bob, you'll click on the ask button. Uh, the next way to interact is through uh, something Shindig calls IMing. Now, if you uh, if you move your cursor, um, I'll, I'll shrink this a little bit to make sure that you can see your, your avatars. If you move your cursor over your avatar, you'll notice that there's that five icon menu there, and one of them says IM. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to click on that IM button, and that will allow you to keep a back channel so you can communicate with the other people who are here this evening. Um, maybe what you can do while I'm while I'm talking is just type in your name and where you're from, um, and maybe something that you'd like to get out of tonight's session. So if you can open up the that IM and you can leave it open on your screen, uh, click on IM type something in there and share it with the other participants. What would you like to get out of the session tonight? And where are you from? And what's your name? So that's the third way of interacting. Remember, we covered the raise hand, we covered the ask, and now we covered I am. And now I'd like to go over the what I think is like the, the piece de resistance of uh, Shindig, and that is the ability to video chat with other participants. I'll expand this for a second so that you can see it. And that is, in Shindig, if you have a webcam and a microphone, you can have a video chat, kind of like a hangout with anybody else who's attending. And I'd like to encourage you to do that right now. I'd like you to click on the avatar of another person. And why don't you discuss with them, um, when has security or privacy policies interfered with student learning that you've seen? And I, that, should, that should cause some, some interesting discussions. I see a couple of you are talking to each other already. I'm going to pull myself down to give you a chance to answer those questions. 
and uh, I'll, I'll pop up in another minute or two after you've had a chance to interact. So click on somebody's avatar, uh, start a discussion with them, and I'll be back up in a minute or two. Good. I hope there's been some spirited discussions, and I, and I hope that a number of you have been uh, keeping a back channel going through IM. Uh, I, I forgot to mention, there's one person here tonight who can't see any of the IMs that you're doing, and that's me. So, um, so I hope that you're IMing, and I hope that you're not saying anything about me in the IM, um, or at least anything bad about me. Um, I do want to thank again uh, FETC. Uh, FETC is is the what's become the largest technology conference, uh, certainly in the winter in the U.S. It, it's taking place in Orlando, Florida, which is pretty convenient to get to from anywhere in the U.S., and it brings together people from all aspects of education to talk about the implications of technology uh, in, in education. Uh, there's there's uh, hundreds of sessions that are going on. There's a huge place to talk to vendors. There's places for uh, to, to expand your community. Uh, so I'd like to encourage as many of you as can make it to come to FETC. And to do that, um, FETC has authorized a promotion code uh, for anybody uh, who's registered tonight. And if you if you go to the FETC web, website or, um, and you click on register or just go to the URL that's, that's above here and you enter in the promo code EDCHAT2, you'll get a discount of $30 off whatever the current uh, registration fee is. And you, we're still in the early time, so you, I think the registration fee is about $100 to $200 less than it is if you were to register at the door. So this is a pretty substantial discount if you if you can put the two of those together. So I'd like to encourage you, um, if, you're, if you're interested in staying up to date with technology, which you obviously are if you're here tonight, uh, that's it's a great conference. And uh, one of the featured speakers is actually, uh, is actually Bob. Uh, coming up on EdChat Interactive on Thursday night, uh, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Uh, we all want kids to take charge of their education. And uh, on Thursday night, we're, we, we're kicking off a three-part series with Howard Knopf on how do you do that. And this, this first session is on school discipline, uh, classroom management, and student self-management. And then we're going to take off there and discuss uh, specific methods for uh, making students autodidactics. So that begins August 6th. And then the following week, uh, uh, we have a session on assessment. How do you make assessment interesting and engaging? And that's being given by Kathy Parrott. And on November 2nd, we have the next in our uh, FETC series with the um, Mary Schillinger uh, talking about the intentional use of, of ed education technology to meet the needs of all students because uh, technology really has the capability of molding itself to different styles of learning and different student capabilities. So uh, that's that should also be a very interesting session. Uh, you all know how to sign up because you, you signed up before, uh, but www.edchatinteractive.org, click on upcoming web events, and then uh, pick the events that you want to register for and hope to see you at future events. Uh, and so now, uh, in a second, I'd like to uh, bring up Bob for our discussion of privacy, security, and innovation. Uh, you, you, if you saw on the website, he's the Director of Innovation, Innovative Learning at the uh, School District in University City, Missouri. Uh, he's been in education. Originally, I had it as 18 years. It turns out he's been in education for over 21 years. And he's one of the spe featured speakers at FETC. So you'll, you'll um, get a chance to, to go more in depth in these topics at FETC if, if you see him there. And let me bring him up. So welcome. Can you hear me, Bob? Hey, thanks, Mitch. Uh, it's good to be here. I can. How am I sounding there? Good. You're good now. For a second, it looked my like you were muted. No good? Am I okay? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Yeah. So um, yeah, you were yeah. telling me you, you um, have a pretty it, busy yeah. travel schedule coming up, right? Yeah, you know, October is a busy month. Uh, I think all of us know that there's, it seems like it's conference season. And mm -hmm. so uh, I get a chance to be in Iowa at their Ed Tech Conference. And then I get a chance to be at the Missouri Ed Tech Conference uh, next week. So I'm looking forward to that. 
and also then followed up with Atlanta where you're working with the school system um, in Fulton County. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing some work in Fulton County, uh, which uh, is a brand new project for me. So I'm super excited to be down in Atlanta, uh, really getting a school kicked off with their one to one and probably talking about some of the same things we're talking about tonight. Okay. Well, then I'm going to pull myself down and get your slides up so you can start talking about them. Sounds great. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, I, I had a little bit of a chuckle after mid said with a warm up for the vice presidential debate tonight. Uh, some of you here in the States and some of you here abroad, uh, but uh, I'm sure there will be a large audience for that this evening. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this topic um, for quite a while. Uh, I served as a teacher and a middle school principal. And as a middle school principal, I had a lot of tech directors that basically told me no until I told them yes. I'm like, well, yes, we're going to figure this out. Yes, we can make this work for kids. And they kept pushing back and saying, you can innovate all you want, but if we have some sort of data privacy issue, it's all going to come crumbling down. And so really over the last six to eight months, I've been trying to figure out how to frame this so it makes sense for everyone in education, from the superintendent to the principal, to the teacher. And so some of the things I've been talking about tonight and giving you a chance to talk about, because I really do love the dynamic nature of this format, um, really hopefully will give you some tips around that. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one if you would, Mitch. Um, you know, I, I heard from a lot of um, some different things that they're looking forward to hearing about tonight. And I, I have w woven some of those in, everything from uh, digital citizenship routines, how to get the right pace of innovation going so that you can kind of be balanced, uh, things like security policies, how do you reach reluctant educators, some things about how do you get K-5 students sharing and being out there and doing collaborative things, and then also how do you build this open communication uh, between the public, between curriculum, between technology, and so, uh, yeah, how do we just keep those things going? So um, that's me there. I am currently serving as the Director of Innovative Learning for the School District of University City. We have about 3,500 kids, K-12, here in St. Louis County. And if you want any of the resources from tonight, uh, please uh, send me an email or mention me on Twitter, and I will make sure that you get those. So all of these, I, I'm, a, I'm a vigorous sharer. And so and anything that I have, you can have. Uh, let's go to the next one there. So I really want to focus on three things and then give you a chance to have some conversation about these three things. Um, when I think about this whole topic, I, I think about three words. One, I think that so much of the data privacy conversation is couched in fear. And I am disgusted by the fact that the only way you can get people to do things is to make them fearful of it. Um, I don't know if anybody else has experienced the uh, creepy clowns in your community, but St. Louis has finally been heat hit by the creepy clown people walking around. And the amount of fear uh, that's floating around isn't healthy. And we can't turn data privacy into this big fearful monster uh, just to get people to do it. So. Um, I think there's a couple other ways. So let's look at the next one there. So this piece is that when it goes with fear and change. And so I, I've thought for a long time that uh, change has been inhibited by the educational boogeyman. Uh, we can't do that because we've never done that, or there's a rule, or there's a policy. And half the time there aren't. And oftentimes we get caught in well, why can't we do that? And it takes those kind of innovative thinkers in our community to be able to say, well, sure, we can balance privacy and innovation. And then the third one uh, that Mitch will go to here is about communication. And so, um, you know, so much of this balance between data privacy and communication has come because a lot of this is like the Tower of Babel. Uh, folks are speaking totally different languages. The superintendent, board, the teachers, the tech directors aren't having a common language around what some of this means. So hopefully I'll give you some of that as well. So I'm going to pause. Uh, certainly if anyone to jump up on stage and say a few things about that, we'll give you that opportunity. All you need to do is raise your hand. But I'm going to ask you to connect with another person in the room and uh, reflect on those three words and how they fit into tonight's topic, fear, change, 
and communication. So I'll come down off the stage and give you a few moments to do that. So this is the time to connect. This is a, another time to connect with another person. Click on the avatar. If you have a webcam, uh, click on the avatar of another person and just start discussion, discussing how uh, fear, change, and communication have impacted te technology policy in your school. Um, if you have thoughts but you don't have a webcam, uh, feel free to use that IM window. Again, just move your, if it's not open now, just move your cursor over your avatar, click on IM, and start typing in some comments. Uh, I'll pull myself down, and uh, we'll get uh, Bob back up in another minute or two. Okay, so I saw you got a chance to talk to somebody. You know, when you ask people to talk about, you know, fear, change, and communication, what are some of the things that they bring up? Yeah, I, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, people won't listen to me unless they are just fearful. Uh, unless I tell them all the horror stories, they won't believe me, they won't do anything. I've also heard that, you know, my superintendent doesn't want to hear from me unless there's a crisis. My job is to keep it fixed, and if it's broken, it's my fault. And so um, I hear I hear some of those things. And then just the other piece of we've always done it that way, and that's the change piece, right, the inertia of things. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm wondering yeah. if somebody is willing to raise their hand and talk about those issues uh, or discuss those issues with you. Um, it's fun. So uh, let's, see. let's see if we can get somebody – an intrepid individual who has no fear, wants to change, and is willing to communicate. But um, I don't see that. I don't see that this time. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, yeah, here's here's Henry. So I'll bring myself down, and I'll bring Henry back up. Okay. Good okay. evening, Henry. How are you? I'm doing well, Bob. Thank uh, you. What How are you? you? Good. Did you have a chance to uh, interact with those words with anyone? What did What did you say? What did they say? Oh, it, it's it's hard. I mean, because I can understand the fear. Because for twelve years, I was a director of technology before becoming a consultant, and it's hard to communicate to people who don't understand that language. This is why they need to do something a certain way. It's like, well, why can't I? install everything I want on my computer or have admin access. Well, there are nasty things on the internet. But it, it's communicating that to people that I didn't want to be a no person and I tried to avoid it, but at the same time, it was like, you know, we need to take this seriously and it, it's hard to get everybody on the same page from both administrators and have their support as well as the teachers. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I, I certainly don't feel like I've got it mastered by any means, but I think that I've continued to try to find over and over that language, like you said, that resonates with people, with their role, with what they're doing in the moment. But it's super hard. I, I would agree with that. And so uh, hopefully we can explore uh, some of the ways to unpack that a little bit later as we roll through this. Okay. All right. Thanks, Henry. So, yeah. Thanks, Mitch. Um, yeah. So, um, I, you know, one of the, you know, I, I just said, hey, let's just not be about fear. Uh, but I think there are some things to note. And so don't take this as fear mongering, but things to note. Uh, read this just the other day that uh, education by far is now experiencing the most acts of ransomware on network. And that term doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, basically, uh, someone comes into your system, they grab access to files, and they lock them down, and they ask you for money to open them back up. Uh, and that can be called cryptoware, and there's a whole bunch of other terms that go with that. But over and over now, we're seeing this huge increase of that happening in education. A, because we have lots of... Um, pertinent information. We have a lot of personally identifiable information on our networks. Uh, hopefully more and more schools are cleaning some of that up, but it is very valuable for folks to have 18 year old social security numbers and not 85 year old social security numbers. So the younger that a social security number can be, the more value that is on the black market. And if Mitch, you'll jump ahead one. 
I saw some of these things the other day around this. Um, a district uh, not too far away uh, just paid $8,500 to get their files back. Uh, that may not seem like a lot to some people, but I guarantee you that $8,500 will get the um, interest of almost anybody in the country of that's what we're paying basically to, um, you know, digital terrorists, if you want to call them that. And then some of these folks are losing files uh, for a long period of time. And so um, this stuff is happening, uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't not, we, we don't have to be fearful of that. So we just need to be conscientious of it. And I think that's the right language is about conscientious of it for everyone instead of being fearful. Let's jump down to the next one here. Um, this caught my attention. I was reading some things uh, the other day. And, you know, when it comes to students, uh, you know, I really do believe that uh, kids care a lot about privacy, uh, but just they view privacy very different than we do. So it's just another call to action that as we craft language for adults, we have to be careful that we craft a different type of language for our students. And so that makes it even more complex than what we're doing. Go down to the next one there. One of the folks that um, I, I spent a lot of time kind of doing some research around is this data quality campaign. And, you know, they said uh, just in 2015, 138 new laws around student privacy in 39 states. And so I think it's important that we know the language of digital privacy, student privacy of their data, and digital citizenship. So all of those can get murky too. So as you're working with the school district, uh, being able to not mush all that stuff together uh, is another important piece of the puzzle. And I'll give you just to ask about that in just one second. So uh, let's go on to the next one. You know, I think the idea of keeping up or staving off attack is almost an impossibility now. Um, you know, I just read this today that in today's cyberscape, more than 300,000 new malware variants are discovered daily. So we can protect and protect and protect, uh, but it's also important to be able to have a response. And so as we kind of go into the nuts and bolts of this evening, I talk about having procedures, talk about having routines. I talk about being able to also be ready for when there is a problem. and then just looking at all of those elements. So we're gonna dive into the first one here uh, as we move forward. After we just do this. And I, I think this might be a good place for us to pause here for a second after uh, I, I talk through this, is that, uh, you know, one of the things we're seeing is that, um, you know, our education system is growing faster than it ever has. I think trying to be a teacher and educator and a leader in this environment is more challenging than ever uh, because of the speed of change and the ability to try to communicate what education means today to our community. Uh, so much of our community still believes that education can work just like it did for them. And we're just well past that. And then the flip side of that is that privacy is never, you know, like I say here, there's never been a deeper reliance on technology to all the aspects, and thus the need to do it safely. And so uh, why don't we pause and give you an opportunity to talk about where do you see innovation and where do you see privacy, uh, and how have you seen them change over the last even 24, 36 months? So. So this is another time uh, to uh, interact. I see, I see you got, you know, the drill. A few of you are already doing this, and uh, I'll pull myself down. And we'll, uh, we'll resume again in another minute. OK, so we, um, we actually had somebody who wanted to make a comment, uh, SJ. So I'm going to bring him up now, OK? OK, sounds great. Hey, good evening. Hi, am I? Hi, how are you, Bob? Hi. I'm well. Uh, glad you're here. Um, uh, Mitch said uh, you wanted to uh, comment on the last piece. 
Yeah, so I've been intrigued by the slew and the, the, the uh, current release of a bunch of films around the policing of our, of our lives without us even knowing it through technology. And as an active Facebook user and blogger, um, there was just this, I wanted to give you the link. I don't know if you saw it, right, the link, but it's called Digging into Facebook's File on You. And what's happening, and you pro most of you probably know this, is that when we're on Facebook, um, they, if we hit like on something, literally what happens is those, those like buttons actually increase um, the likelihood of, of us being targeted by certain advertisements. And so what's happening is those, the more that we hit like, our profiles are being cataloged to certain companies who then create lists and those lists get sold. And so they're the, so then what happens is people start creating, whoever these people are, they're creating <laughs> a profile of us. So they know what we're doing both online and offline. And those, those pieces of information are being used to hack us. Um, it's also increasing the revenue of those businesses, right? Um, and so I guess there are these algorithms that people write codes for in order to surveil each of us. So while we think we're probably enjoying our time on Facebook, we're also contributing to our own like social demise at the same time. And I think that teaching kids about, you know, what happens with the with this process is really important to their um, safety. Yeah, I, I think you're a hundred percent right. And I, I think that, you know, very few adults they may recognize it at a really thirty thousand foot level, like, hey, yeah, Facebook has some of our information. But even what you just described there, I would imagine less than 10% of the population could articulate. And let alone our kids that are now going to spend the next 20 or 30 years uh, walking through those things. And so, uh, and they're not only being mined by one thing, they're probably being mined by 10 or 12 different social networks at the same time. Yeah. And the other thing that I've noticed, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but like, so when I'm on Facebook, like I'm a, I'm a triathlete, right? So a pair of Solomon shoes will pop up on my Facebook feed because I, you know, but what's happening is that's happening to me like on Google now and Yahoo. So I'm starting to three, see the three dimensionality of how my information, right, is obviously being sold without me even knowing it. Yeah. And um, I, I've noticed that as well. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a runner as well. And I can't tell you how many things I'm getting now that say, can you run an eight minute mile? Have you seen these, right? Like, can you run an eight minute mile? We'll give you better insurance. Right. Or then a new pair of shoes or shorts or something that I wasn't even looking for a shop that pops up, right? Because it's a cross section of the run. Yeah, uh, totally. So, so um, yeah, I think uh, a, cu a couple of things down here, I want to, I want to mention as we kind of pop back into the slides, um, a couple of things we can do to kind of articulate that with our kids. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it's a good real world example of something that it's about awareness and not, doesn't have to be about fear. But at least we know that every time we hit a button, uh, we're contributing to big and little data. I think that's important. So let's jump on, uh, Mitch, as we talk a little bit about policies here. So um, I've always kind of been uh, not a rule follower, uh, which doesn't make it easy to be a teacher or a principal or a tech director. Uh, I think uh, our rule followers of the world um, govern and manage our schools really well. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's treated me really well. So I've always kind of been uh, this fine line between where do we use rules and where do we use wisdom. So I don't advocate for writing 42 policies. Uh, I can tell you, though, that in the state of Missouri, uh, five school districts just went through a cybersecurity audit by the Missouri State Auditor's Office. And it was list a list of policies and procedures that needed to be written. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of those, but I did find some kind of fundamental um, pieces that uh, I thought were good driving questions to take back to your school district. So we can jump uh, real quick to the one, and then we'll go to the next one. If you're looking for good things here, the foundation, um, there we go, the Foundation for Excellence in Education uh, has some really good fundamental principles around this. And um, I think... Um, I, I think they're worth talking about, and I'll just hit the high level of these. But each of them, I think, can start a conversation, which a lot of this is how do we keep 
a continuous conversation going about data privacy and innovation in our schools. It can't be the checkbox at the beginning of the year where we tell people the rules. It can't be that one-off conversation that we've had once a month, but how do we continue to prime the pump around these conversations? So uh, the Foundation for Excellence in Education points at these things. So we'll kind of move through these fairly quickly. The first one is about uh, the value of data. And I think, I thought this was interesting in that, um, you know, it says states, but, you know, insert district, if you would, uh, should recognize the value of data, knowing that, like, every piece of data we collect is valuable or needs to be valuable. We should not collect any data that is just extraneous because it can lead to some of the things that SJ was talking about, right? This whole piece about, like, extra data being out there about kids, about adults that um, can just be taken. Uh, in a breach. And so let's value the data we do collect. The second thing they ask is, how are you transparent about your things? And so I think that one of the things that schools has fallen down on is how do we build a narrative? And it is a narrative. It's not technical in nature. It's a, it's a narrative that could be understood by internal and external publics that clearly communicates how data is collected, as well as how it's stored and used and shared. And so I think if you're not doing that as a school district, that is a great first step uh, as you're trying to figure out kind of what this looks like. The next one is what does it feel like to only collect what is absolutely necessary? Could schools eliminate 50% of the data that they collect and not just collect data by inertia? I think oftentimes we have filled out the same forms for the same kids for the last 15 years. And a lot of that information really isn't valuable to us. And I think it's worth having a conversation around that. The next one has to do with not only being uh, limited collection, but limited use. So do we do a good job of making sure that not everybody has the data? I have to fall on my own sword here and say that I just closed like 400 antiquated accounts that had access to our student information system because no one closed them. And who knows who got in there? I don't think anybody was in there doing anything malicious, but they could have. And so we need to think about those type of policies as well. And then the final three here, and we'll just cruise through these and give you a chance to talk about any of these that resonated. One is what about accuracy and accessibility? Uh, can we guarantee that the information in there is accurate? Can you imagine if a student profile went to another school and deemed that student to not be in classes of advanced readiness or have inaccurate information in it, or heaven forbid something like uh, the book, The Two West Moors, where the West Moors transcripts got sent wrongly or uh, student transcripts with the same names got sent. So how can we make sure we're super accurate, super secure, and we have some level of accountability around that. I'm gonna step back around those policy ideas and see if any of those resonate with folks and maybe get somebody to step up, uh, say a few words about um, how they as a district are handling some of these things. So let me step down and give you a chance to talk. Okay, again, this is the time to interact with each other um, and discuss some of these, uh, I'll, I'll make these a little bit smaller, uh, discuss these uh, items that uh, Bob has gone through. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. I meant to take you back to uh, accuracy and accessibility, limited use, limited collection, transparency, value the data, and here, here is the list. So uh, talk about uh, these amongst yourself, and if you're willing to come up on stage, uh, maybe raise your hand, and when Bob comes back up, we'll, uh, we'll bring you up to talk about this with everybody. I'll pull myself down now. Sorry, I, I pressed the wrong thing too fast. One sec. Okay. So, um, I, I don't know, do you get a chance to talk to, to anybody or? Yeah, no, I didn't jump in that time. Uh, so, I'm okay. interested to hear maybe how a conversation went. All right, so uh, please, somebody click the raise hand button and uh, let's let's get a conversation going. You saw it wasn't bad. So uh, 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 neither Bob nor I bite. 
And so please raise your hand. So then I'll just I'll just ask you what you know um, as you talk to districts, which do you think of of those? I guess there were there were six of them, uh, six yeah. six points or seven point seven seven points. Uh, value of data, right. transparency, limited collection, limited use, accuracy and accessibility, security and accountability. Are, is there any that just stick out? Yeah, j two really. I, I think this we're not we don't have an open dialogue about what we collect from our kids with our parents. Um, we haven't done a very good job of talking about that. And then the second one being, we really are collecting way too much data. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about assessment data. That's a whole nother hours worth of conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Really just talking about demographic data and all kinds of personal data from kids that uh, just oftentimes isn't necessary. Um, I know uh, I had a secretary that had $900,000 worth of black market social security numbers in an Excel spreadsheet on her computer. Um, we can't allow that to happen, right? So we're collecting right. too much information. Yeah. So, um, so Anne McMullen raised her hand. And do you know Anne? I, I think so. I'm, I, I can't put it in context, but I do think I know Anne. Well, so she's also a featured speaker at FEC, and she always has something really interesting to say. So um, I'm sure she has some good comments. I'm going to bring myself down. She raised her hand, and I'm going to bring her up. Hey, good evening, Thank Anne. Thank you, Mitch and Bob. Good to see you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the one that really resonated with me is one that you just addressed, and that is the issue of transparency and of communicating to our parent community and, and really the community at large what we're doing around data, but honestly around anything in ed tech. And I think it's, it's always interesting to me that uh, we who are in the education business do a really lousy job of educating the broader community. And I think it's particularly critical on this issue of data privacy because parents hear all kinds of things. And if we don't really articulate and again, going back to the point you made earlier, in language that they understand as to how we're being responsible with their students' data, um, we're just missing a great opportunity and creating more problems for ourselves that we don't really need. So thank you for bringing that point up because I think it's critical. Yeah, and I think you're completely right, Ann. And just like anything else, it's this piece around how do we get a lot of positive into the system so when a negative thing does happen uh, we've got some goodwill and i think that across the board for um, deprivatizing practice in classroom and all of these things but another one's you're probably going to have a data breach at some point in time as a school district you know what we might as well let parents know that we're proactive we work hard on it here's how we do it and if something does happen they'll be like well we know they work hard they've told us all about it and you know what these things happen if you don't do that, you don't set the tone, you don't create space, you don't create goodwill. So um, the second thing I do want to mention is routines. And this is probably the area that um, most um, folks uh, in this space uh, tonight uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about. How do we get people in the routine of thinking about data privacy? Uh, what does that ongoing training look like to have that culture of data privacy going on? Uh, and it's really, really hard uh, because it's the last thing that teachers want to do when something pops up on their screen and says, you have to change your password. It's every 90 days or whatever it is. So I, I came down uh, and, and worked with the folks at I Keep Safe. if we go to the next one here. And they have built out a really nice document about how to do training for edgics. And I'm not going to go into each of these bullet points, but they really do point to four areas to consider. And if I, if I send you the slide deck or you get a hold of the slide deck, it's a little more detailed, but it has some really specific questions uh, that you can go back and begin to have conversations around. Everything from like, what is privacy and why does it matter? Um, things like, what is FERPA? And then how can I best keep sensitive information in certain places? So I think that the way to enter into this is to begin to ask questions, saying, I don't know the answer. But we need to explore this together. And I think they do a really nice job of thinking about uh, data security uh, and being able to ask, you know, what are best practices around passwords and data disposal 
which is actually a really big deal as teachers have um, devices that they're turning in. If all of this data is on a Google Drive that's on a you know phone that they're trading in, are they guaranteeing that they've signed out? Have they done those sorts of things? And then also the things that you know we hear the fear-based stuff around online communication and social media. So I think those routines are really important, and I really do think they're based on asking some questions. And I, I have provided some of those questions in the deck. I'm actually going to jump down though and talk about systems a little bit. And um, you know, we can see the questions there, and they'll be available to you. Uh, the systems that I think about um, are both big and small. I think about uh, things like Google. I would imagine many of you are Google uh, districts. Maybe you have uh, the Google Suite. Uh, it, you know, it has its whole um, people love it, people hate it sort of situation. People love, and then people worry about it. Um, but I would direct you to the link at the bottom there that really talks through how Google is compliant. Sometimes that comes up in districts that, how can you guys be Google? They're giving away all your information. They don't, they're not FERPA regulated, all those sorts of things. And I think that document at the bottom does a nice job. I think Microsoft does a nice job with that as well. And um, you can see their documentation there. Now, certainly they're not perfect and I'm sure there's holes to poke in the system but it really is nice to have at least some documentation from them that you can push back if anybody is saying uh, things about either of those big giants. Uh, our friends over at COSIN have been doing a lot of work around this, and I provide some other resources in here. One is this uh, trusted learning environment uh, seal, and now there's a lot of companies, a lot of ed partners that are getting this uh, TLE seal basically saying that they are handling student data correctly. So someone had asked about third-party apps. Uh, one way is to trust COSIN and saying that they have vetted the folks that have the seal. So I think that's one way to look at it. Uh, COSIN's also involved uh, with a huge partnership, uh, and that's on the next slide here, that has brought a consortium of folks together to kind of build out these 10 principles to guide and use and protection of student data. And if you go to studentdataprinciples.org, you can kind of take a look at that. Um, two final things in the systems area, then I'll pause. Um, one is kind of the nitty gritty. So if there's any tech directors here, um, we know that making sure that you have a next generation firewall is really important as well as whatever you can call next generation antivirus. And so there's been a lot of advances over the last um, year, year and a half about how endpoints are managed around all of these things. And so uh, certainly if you're a technology specialist or a superintendent or a, a teacher, some of these things aren't going to say, hey, these are a part of my language, but just know that all of these things have evolved hugely in the last 18 months. And if your school district hasn't evolved with them, uh, you're starting to put yourself at some risk. So if antivirus and firewall haven't changed or updated uh, to where they're this next generation, uh, you're starting to fall behind. So let me pause. We have uh, still a bit of time to have you talk about teams and systems, and then I'll come back and finish this up. And I just want to say for all of you that uh, these URLs have been flashing by pretty quickly, but we will post the slides up on the website, uh, so you'll be able to get to the links, um, and we'll probably be posting them around Thursday. So I'll bring myself down and uh, go ahead and discuss uh, how your schools are handling these things and what you'd like to see changed. Okay. So, um, you know, I'll, I guess since we only have technically about five or six minutes left, uh, do you want me to just go on, uh, go on to the next slides, or do you want to see if anybody wants to come yeah, up? Yeah, let's get let's get finished. Yeah, let's get finished up. I uh, I'll finish up in uh, three minutes or so, and if there's any questions, we'll take them at the end. So yeah, just um, one last topic, think to hit, and I think I've mentioned it briefly. Uh, is making sure that you're prepared um, for any type of data breach that happens. 
Um, and I mentioned the stats before, and I think this is just going to be coming commonplace. Uh, and there are different types of data breaches. And so I, I don't want to you know, make you think that it's always about like a hacker coming in and grabbing information. Uh, it can be a number of things. So it can be a data security risk. And so that makes, you know, that's pretty intuitive if we look at that slide. And we'll come down another two there, Mitch, the, the one on data security. And really, this is this is the one that's happening. This is the one where you're seeing that, uh, you know, someone's trying to come in from the outside and grab things. But the other one is behavioral incidents. And this is also uh, about data privacy. And And, you know, it's the one that really can stop schools in their tracks. It's responding to those incidents of cyberbullying, online gossiping, sexting, you know, that require another type of incident response because people have used data poorly. Um, and, you know, that, you know, you can think of data a little bit differently in that sort of thing. But I encourage schools to do, and we'll come down to the next slide, and I'm certainly not going to read bullet points, but I'm going to give these to you, is that think about what you would do before the breach happens. How can you set yourself up um, for not allowing some of these things to get to an extreme level? And so that is the conversation that I would encourage you to go back and have, is how do you deal with some of these things beforehand and act preventatively? Uh, and then unfortunately, there are some things that you have to do after something like this happens. And um, I, I link to it at the bottom, but there's some really good advice and some more details about what to do after the afterwards. And so I think I think that's it. And so um, we'll come down to the last next slide on fear. And I'm just kind of coming back to those three words again as a way to um, kind of um, really um, set ourselves and set a tone here to finish is that when I think about innovation, and I've, I've spent 20 years trying to be an innovative teacher and principal and tech director, and I am full blazes ahead. Uh, I don't live in this realm of fear. Uh, people have to tap me on the shoulder, remind me that bad things happen. And so all I ask is that if you're one of those innovators, just make sure that as you're building the second story of the house and building the third story of the house, that you have the back door closed. And that's the analogy that I've been using uh, with senior leadership and saying, you know what, innovate like the Dickens as fast as possible. But you know what, just make sure you close the back door at night. Uh, and I think that that's a way that's resonated with some people. And the second thing is about change, right? Uh, as soon as we're able to figure out how to do some of these things, um, all the folks that care deeply about data privacy are like, okay, we've got it fixed. Let's stay right here when the reality is, is that we're in a very fluid, dynamic type of innovation happening. And so as soon as we have data privacy figured out, it's antiquated. So we have to be able to not only change for kids, the organizational change, we have to realize that data privacy is also kind of a moving target that we wanna keep up with, but we can never be under the false sense of security that we have changed it and we're, we've arrived. And then finally, uh, it's about communication. How can we continue to ask questions and get more people looped into these conversations? Hopefully I've given you uh, some ideas, some ways, some language, and I'm certainly happy to continue the conversation with all of you. Um, I don't have it all figured out, but we are entering into these conversations in a deep way across our community uh, with everyone at, at University City. And we think it's really important if we're going to be a digital age district to make sure that we're covering ourselves and having these really important conversations. Uh, leave uh, the last chunk of time to questions, if there is any. If not, you can certainly uh, reach me and I'm happy to answer them offline as well. Well, so one question is, how are you going to be covering these topics at FETC? And what else are you going to be talking about there? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think we're going to really try to workshop of this. We're going to give folks an opportunity at FETC to really dig into some of these things, uh, use some checklists, decide here's where we're good, here's where we're not good, here's where I think we could improve. Uh, really give some folks uh, some takeaways that they can go back to their district and talk about, okay, 
he talked about these seven systems. Are we having conversations about two of these, not two of these, and two of these I've never heard of? Really give folks kind of a sense of where they are. Uh, and then hopefully um, continue to cross-pollinate best practices. Because I'm sure there'll be folks there that are doing a good job in some of these. And I think conferences, more than anything else, are an opportunity to release trap wisdom into the system. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I was thinking is that you know you talk about fear, change, and communication. And as you were saying that, I was thinking that the three are kind of like a circle. So, so you, something happens and causes you fear, then you embark on change, and then you you communicate, and that kind of lessens the fear until the next big thing comes, in which case the cycle starts all over again. And it really could go either way. Right? If you start off with communication, uh, then it makes it easier to change. And, and by having the communication and the changes, it reduces the fear. So the, the circle goes in both ways. Yeah, and I do think it's a choice, right? You either have a clockwise circle that, uh, or a counterclockwise circle, one that starts with fear or one that starts with communication. Uh, they both mm -hmm. elicit change, uh, but you get to make the choice on which way that spins. Oh, that, I think that's pr that's pretty powerful. Uh, so, does if uh, does anybody have any questions that you want to uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you up to ask uh, Bob a question? Otherwise, uh, maybe maybe you'll see him at FETC and you can ask your questions directly there. Or he gave you his email address and his uh, Twitter handle, and you could reach him on Twitter. Um, so, uh, do you have a uh, maybe a closing thought? Other, other than choosing which way, which way you want to travel around the circle, which I think is incredibly powerful, um, what else? Yeah, I, I would just say there's a chance tomorrow to have a meaningful conversation with somebody about this topic. And I would just encourage uh, you to do so. There'll be an opening where one of those questions, one of those will fit naturally. Uh, and that's a good way to practice kind of making this a habitual thing. Well, thank you, and I guess I'll, and I'll see you in Florida, and and online. Sounds great. And on Facebook. And on Facebook. Yeah, thanks to everyone. And right, but I'm not liking anything you put out there, Mitch, because uh, then you'll be profiling me. I profile you anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Good night to everyone. Uh, happy presidential debating. Okay. Well, uh, good night to everybody from uh, EdChat Interactive. Uh, we want to thank FETC again. Remember, if you use the code FETC2. You get a discount on your registration and uh, hope to see you on Thursday for our next event. And uh, we'll having, we're having at least one a week uh, coming up for the next uh, four or five weeks. So good night from EdChat Interactive and I'll see you at the debate.